Welcome, welcome, welcome to our annual convocation uh, honoring this year's 2014 Posey Leadership Award winner, Dr. Nathan Wolf. We are just thrilled to have him here with us, and I think we're going to have a wonderful time learning from him and about him. As many of you know, this award was set up to recognize an individual who's made a significant impact on the world through service and leadership. And it allows us to bring that individual to campus to spend time with our students, our faculty, and our community and staff. And it's, it's a tremendous opportunity. The award bears the name of Sally and Lee Posey, who have been significant supporters and friends of the college for many, many years. Um, they've supported the Posey Leadership Institute, um, and they also created the endowment for this award. This was a project that I know was very dear to Lee Posey's heart. He worked very closely with President Emeritus Oscar Page, who is here with us today, uh, to establish the, the Leadership Institute and this award. And we're, we're grateful, uh, to, certainly for Oscar's vision, and also, obviously, to um, Lee's. Lee Posey, who was the founder of Palm Harbor Homes and, and a dear friend to, to many of us, uh, passed away in 2008. Happily, Sally, his wife, remains a very good friend to the college and to many of us, and we'll see her tonight. She'll be with us at the, at the museum this evening. As a college president, one of the best things I get to do is to introduce uh, members of our terrific faculty. Um, and it is a particular pleasure to introduce Dr. Peggy Redshaw. She is professor of biology, and her interests in her, for her research and her teaching are in human genetics, infectious diseases, and public health. And many of you in the community know that she is also the co-director of the Telling Our Stories Project, where she um, and, her, uh, uh, and her husband and their partners work with uh, folks here in Grayson County and help them tell their stories. Um, and she's particularly um, coalesced uh, stories around the impact of the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic um, and its impact here in this, in this area. This past year, Peggy has really helped lead our efforts on campus to learn about Dr. Wolf's work. And she has been leading a faculty reading group and making several presentations to campus and community groups about the viral storm. So please join me in giving a very warm kangaroo welcome to Dr. Peggy Redshaw. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Nathan Wolf to you. You can read a short biography on the program, but there are a few highlights I would like to mention. Dr. Wolf received his Bachelor of Arts in Human Biology from Stanford in 1993 and earned his doctorate in Immunology and Infectious Diseases from Harvard in 1998. He has received numerous awards, including a Fulbright Fellowship and the NIH Director's Pioneer Award. He was named a National Geographic Emerging Explorer in 2009 and a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader in 2010. Dr. Wolf has over eight years of experience living and conducting biomedical research in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and he co currently coordinates the activities of over 50 scientists and staff in countries around the world. His work has been featured in documentaries for National Geographic and CNN's Planet in Peril, and he has had multiple appearances on NPR and National Geographic Weekend. Dr. Wolf, welcome to Austin College. Students and staff and faculty are excited you're on our campus, and we look forward to hearing your presentation entitled, Exploring the Unseen World. Um, well, President Haas and Professor Redshaw uh, and the entire Austin College community, first I want to thank you for this really, truly unique uh, honor to participate in the Posey Leadership Award program. It's an incredible group of recipients, and 
I'm really humbled to be a part of this group. And I did make some promises backstage that in the future, if I continue to, to win awards, maybe even substantive ones, I'll be wearing a kangaroo t-shirt. So, so, so I've got you. Um, um, so I like to start presentations uh, with this figure here. And some of you may be familiar with this figure. Uh, this is actually, in fact, the first uh, GIS. It's the first um, geographic information system that we know of, and it was also produced by John Snow, who we consider to be the father of epidemiology. And it's an interesting story, really. This was the first time that somebody sat down and put information on a map to try to understand patterns. And this was the, uh, the infamous cholera outbreak in Soho in London in 1854. And at the time, there really wasn't a good understanding of cholera and how it spread. And Snow said, hey, let's look at the cases, and let's put little marks on this map. And to make a long story short, what he determined was that it was associated with water supplies, which of course now we know is the cause of cholera, or at least the mechanism by which it's transmitted. He removed the pump uh, handle, and the cholera outbreak went away. And I think it's very important to sort of keep in mind sort of how much we have advanced in terms of our capacity to understand infectious diseases. Now, uh, if you think about somebody who's a virus hunter like myself, whose objective is to understand the potential diseases out there, you might imagine that um, I would be starting off with a discussion of diseases that affect wild animals. This is anthrax and an ape. Uh, or other important diseases. This is monkeypox that's affecting a young man in uh, Central Africa. And I'm going to be talking about those things. Uh, fortunately, he did recover later in this outbreak. Um, but I actually want to start with a slightly different perspective. And it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to uh, college students like yourself and people in the Sherman community. And I had a wonderful day yesterday. Um, I've ended up talking to folks in your senior leadership, but also fourth and eighth graders. And I think one of the most exciting things from my perspective about microbiology is it really brings us back to an earlier time, a time when there was a tremendous amount out there to be discovered. So while we think about the deadly viruses, most of the viruses out there have no interest in human populations whatsoever. This is, I'd like to introduce you now to the most common form of life on our planet. It's the phage, and it's a virus that in fact infects bacteria. Um, and that's, that's the most common form of life on our planet. Uh, a good chunk of the diversity of genetic information on our planet is locked up in these suckers. To give you just some sense of how important microbes are on our planet and how much they represent in terms of life, if you imagine an extraterrestrial, intelligent extraterrestrial biologist that was really tasked with the objective of coming to Earth and documenting the diversity of life that we have here, they would write an encyclopedia. Let's say it was about 36 volumes. Um, well, the first 32 volumes or so of that would be devoted to the microbial world, things we can't even see, bacteria, archaea, viruses. There'd be three very slender volumes uh, on fungal species, plants, and animals. And if we think about ourselves as humans, uh, we'd be a footnote in that book on animals. Uh, it would be an interesting footnote, but really a footnote nonetheless. Um, if you microbes go up to miles above the surface of our planet, um, they exist in clouds. If you scraped off the side of the space station, you very well could see remnants of microbial communities. If you dig miles beneath the deepest oceans, miles beneath where we stand right here, you'll see teeming masses of microbial species. Um, in fact, the, one of the only single organisms you can see from space are colonies of cyanobacteria. Uh, this is one of my favorite current microbes out there. Um, and if you, it, as you're breathing, as you're sort of hearing me say this sentence, about one out of every three breaths that you take comes from oxygen generated by photosynthesis done from these cyanobacteria right here. And then if you take a moment and you actually think about the other two breaths, if one is, is from cyanobacteria photosynthesis, the other two, of course, we'd think back to plants and their capacity to do photosynthesis. But is it really plants that do photosynthesis? It is, but what part of plants? I think all of 
How many biologists do we have in the crowd? How many people are studying biology just out of curiosity? I know this is one of your top three um, majors here at Austin College. So all of you and everybody will know about chloroplast. Now when we think of chloroplast, we think about it as the organelle, the little part, the little factory in plant cells that do photosynthesis and really produce the oxygen that permits us to breathe as a waste product, incidentally. What we don't often think about is that, in fact, these chloroplasts, like mitochondria in our cells, have their own genetic information. And in fact, they're descendant from external bacteria that have invaded the ancestors of plant cells many, many years ago and became a part of the fundamental fabric of plant cells. So in fact, one out of every three of those breaths come from photosynthesis done by cyanobacteria. The other two came from long-lost cousins, the cyanobacteria that we now call chloroplasts that are in plant cells. So microbes make up the very fabric of life, the air we breathe. They're fundamental parts of our oceans, our air, and the deepest seas. And even if we think about our own bodies, if we add up all the mass and the importance of microbes in our body, this is sort of the microbiome, uh, it may in fact be the largest and perhaps one of the most important organs in our body. Um, this incidentally is the, the most pleasant picture of the human gut that you're ever likely to see in your life. Um, it's a, um, this was done by Martin Ogerly, who uh, is an artist that I collaborated with on a National Geographic magazine piece um, that I, I wrote last year. And it's simply just a colorized electron micrograph. And I think as we look at these, we get a sense of also the potential beauty and nature of these sorts of organisms. The world is changing very, very dramatically in terms of the technology that permits us to really interrogate and explore this microbial world. Many of you will be familiar with Moore's Law, which really um, is the radically decreasing price of uh, microprocessors and our capacity to do computation. Well, even more radical is the decreased price in sequencing. So our capacity to use genetic tools to pull out the blueprints of microbes and understand them in fundamental new ways has changed so dramatically over even the course of my career of the last 15 years that we do things now that we would have never even imagined doing you know, 10, 20 years ago. There are other important things that are really changing about our planet. Um, this is a, uh, just shows you a representation of flights that are currently coming and going from the continental United States. Of course, what's striking is you don't have to actually uh, show the outlines of North America because you can see there are so many flights coming and going. And really, this is part of a much broader phenomena which is occurring in our world, which is this interconnectivity of humans and animals um, that's really fundamentally changing the landscape of our planet. And again, I think it's very easy for us to forget at any one moment how different things are. But if you went back 100 years or so, uh, a disease that entered into a population, maybe it would spread locally within a village or community, maybe it would move to another village. But by and large, um, new diseases would sort of either wipe out populations or themselves go extinct. We now live in a situation where a virus that enters into a person in Central Africa or East Asia has the capacity to be here in Sherman, Texas over the course of really a day or two. And this makes a, a really an important difference in the way that we interact with microbes on our planet. You know, of course, one of the, the consequences uh, is outbreaks like SARS. This is a virus that started its life in bats. It jumped from bats into civets, which is sort of a mongoose-like predator that's grown up for food in parts of East Asia. It then ended up jumping into humans and very, very quickly spreading around the planet. So this interconnectivity fundamentally changes the potential that one of these viruses will win the equivalent of a sort of epidemic lottery and be able to get into sort of humans and our animals and be able to spread around the world. And I'm going to be talking a lot about that. But before I do, I just want to make a, sort of a small footnote uh, which is less of a footnote for the animals around us, we tend to be very interested, understandably, in the microbes of animals that cross into humans and create uh, major epidemics. But this movement of humans around the planet also has a huge impact on the animals on our planet. So we're not just moving viruses and microorganisms that have significance for ourselves. 
we're also moving microorganisms that have the significance for populations like amphibians. Um, many of you will be familiar with the amphibian declines that we've experienced over the last couple of decades. We've really seen the loss of a tremendous number of species. Uh, frog species like the beautiful harlequin frogs have become uh, completely extinct, disappeared from our planet. And it's because of a fungus that we've tracked around the world on our shoes and through other ways that we've spread this fungus. And because it encounters populations that are previously naive, that don't have the appropriate immunity, it really has tremendous capacity to uh, devastate animal populations. So this is not just a story about humans and our illnesses. It's really a story about how uh, sort of the human changes that we've experienced on this planet are infecting life of every sort. Um, and by and large, we're not doing very well with these pandemics. Uh, if, if you think back to the beginning of the AIDS pandemic, uh, or at least if, uh, when I think back about it, the first real early memories I have of this were when Magic Johnson announced to the world that he was uh, HIV positive. Uh, so we think about sort of the beginnings of this pandemic perhaps in the 80s, um, but we actually know more about the origins of HIV than we do about any other virus that faces humanity. And it's a virus that actually crossed from chimpanzee populations into humans um, over 100 years ago. So by the time we had the Great Depression in 1929, there were individuals in Central Africa who were infected with HIV. And this brings up, I think, a really profound and important question for all of us, because we certainly have some amazing sophistication, technical sophistication as a species, and we, we think pretty highly of ourselves. Yet, how is it possible that you could have a virus like HIV that crossed into humans at some time in the you know, early part of the 20th century, and it wasn't until 1981 before we saw the syndrome of AIDS and first identified it. It wasn't until 1983 before we had identified the virus HIV that caused AIDS. It wasn't until 86 or 87 before political leaders really began to seriously discuss AIDS in our world. And I think um, sort of the, the corollary to that, so that's the bad news. The good news is how different could the world have been had we identified HIV early? And I think many of us um, think about uh, chaotic effects. These are the idea that a small perturbation in early conditions will lead to a big effect later on in life. This is the famous butterfly effect, where if a butterfly flaps its wings somewhere in Singapore, you have a hurricane on the other side of the world. And um, we normally think of these chaotic effects as being negative, right? Hurricanes is the classic example, the butterfly effect. But I'd like to put forward to you today that chaotic effects also have the potential to be profoundly positive. So, and I would say that finding uh, early examples of diseases before they spread is exactly one of these. So just to give you one example of the many, many ways in which early identification improves our capacity to really capture these things and have major public health consequences. Had we been studied, had we identified AIDS as a syndrome in Central Africa, perhaps during the 50s or 60s or even 70s, one of the things that we would have seen very quickly is that its spread was primarily through heterosexual transmission uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now that might have seemed unimportant at the time, but when it started showing up primarily uh, in gay populations in the 80s in the United States, it would have had a profound difference in terms of the political ramifications and might have permitted us to respond in a much quicker way. And I think you could go and think about this from any different perspective. Once we've really identified these things, it gives us a huge, huge advantage. And so uh, what I really do for my day job, I'm fascinated with the microbes in our guts and all around us, and I've, I've spent some time writing and thinking about that, but my day job is really to try to understand the ways in which viruses emerge from animal populations into people and to try to set up systems to really stop that. And we now know quite a bit about the process by which new viruses enter and spread in human populations. What we know is that the greatest diversity of viruses of importance to people exist in wild mammals. And so wherever we see the greatest diversity of wild mammals, and the closest interface between those mammals and humans, that's where these viruses are sort of bubbling up. And my postdoctoral mentor, Don Burke, 
um, came up with this great term viral chatter. And the idea of viral chatter is that we can watch the patterns by which these viruses are jumping into populations. And many of the viruses that jump over into people will never go on to become pandemics. But yet if we study this interface and we really understand the nature of that transmission, we may be able to understand patterns that would let us to identify those early events and to be able to stop them before they become sort of the next HIV. Um, and in fact, the problem has been historically global disease control, and this is something that I'm very sort of um, pleased and proud to have been a part of a movement over the last 10 to 15 years that's changed this, but historically global disease control has always waited for agents to become globally distributed before you really kick in a response. And that's, that's kind of the equivalent of um, going to your cardiologist and saying, oh, well, uh, I have a family history of heart disease and I'm a smoker, I have high blood pressure, and having your cardiologist say, oh, don't worry, if you have a heart attack, we have some real good surgery and we're gonna be able to help you out. And all of us know that the first thing we would do after we screamed would be to fire the cardiologist that said that to us. Um, but still, that's where we exist with regards to pandemics. We wait for the heart attack, and by and large, we respond. And uh, this is the thing that we think really needs to dras drastically change. And so when I started my research uh, in Central Africa in 1998, uh, the first population we really thought that we would look at is people who were hunters. And what we know is that people around the world, everybody really hunts animal, local animals in the places they'd live. Just out of curiosity, how many hunters do we have in the crowd here? Don't be shy. Because uh, I asked the same question the other day, uh, and I got very few answers. This was in Galveston, and I said, hey, we're in Texas. I want to see some more hunters out there. And I said, people are being shy. I think you're being shy. I bet we've got some more hunters out there. Um, but what hunters know, which many people in contemporary society don't know, is what it really means to take an animal from being a living animal to something that ends up on your table. And I think, you know, frankly, I'll just tell you my own political take, which is that I, I think it's almost one of those things I'm exaggerating here, but people should have a license. Everybody should be able to eat meat, but they should have had to have at least slaughtered a single animal to understand what that means before they eat it. And, and I think that hunters really have a really among the most sort of uh, intensive understanding of this process. It's not an easy process. You inevitably will end up having contact with blood and tissues. And so our idea was particularly for animals that we thought were important reservoirs for diseases, we could follow these hunters and watch as viruses, monitor the viruses and the animals and the people and actually perhaps see the origination event, the spillover event that leads to these sorts of epidemics. And of course, this is not just hunters, there's other interfaces uh, in, East Af in East Asia, for example, wild animal markets have been really important in the origins of viruses like SARS, but it, fundamentally it's this interface between humans and animals, and again, for a variety of reasons, wild animals end up being very, very important to this process. So I thought I would take a little bit of time just to show you some slides of what it means to do some of this, this uh, work in the field. Uh, and particularly for the students in the audience, I was a, uh, started off in 98, and I was a very naive uh, postdoc. I said, okay, fine, Cameroon, we'll pick out 17 sites, we'll sample humans and animals, we'll get viable functional lymphocytes and behavioral data. Um, <laughs> and of course, uh, um, you find out that the, the difficulties in field work um, really can be very, very substantial. Um, Fortunately, what we found in our work all around the world, and this is sort of the new model for international scientific work, is that it's really sort of working to collaborate with and when necessary, empower local scientists. And you see wonderful scientists. Um, this is Ubal Tamofe, who I work with very closely. We've been working together for about 15 years. He's the scientist who runs our Central African program. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on this picture, this is us coming back from a rural site about two days drive away from our laboratory. And we had just about that two day window in order to maintain our specimens uh, at room temperature and have them be viable. And of course, um, it's difficult to get these specimens. You have to have communities trust you. Uh, and so we're here, all these people, this is us coming back to our laboratory. Of course, we see this jackknife truck. 
Uh, and the, the reason I show uh, this picture of Ubald, he laughs at me because he can't see his face, but is that you can, what you can see from this picture is that he's about to solve this problem. Um, and in fact, he did solve the problem and we managed to uh, um, get our way around this and get the specimens back. Uh, and it's exactly that sort of collaboration that permits this work to occur. Um, Another story, uh, this is a, one of the most effective communicators I've really run into in my entire life. Uh, this is uh, Paul DeLong Minutu, uh, and he uh, was someone who I met very early on in my time in Cameroon. And you can kind of think of Paul as the Sanjay Gupta of Cameroon. So Paul um, is, was responsible, he was the primary journalist who, through television and radio, communicated health issues to the entire country of Cameroon. And what was absolutely incredible is we would get out to these rural villages and uh, they may not you know, recognize him. He would show up and, and he, they wouldn't recognize him because they didn't necessarily have television. But as soon as he began to speak, they would recognize his voice from the radio and he would be sort of a trusted figure that could really help us. And again, I think it's really important to remember, just to give you an example of what it's like, I just think for a moment that you're in your house in the morning, somebody knocks on your door, clearly not from the United States. You can't quite figure out where they're from. They're speaking with a pretty heavy accent. They say, look, I've got some piece of paper. I want to come into your house. I want to ask you questions about your sexual behavior, what you hunt. Um, I want to talk to your children and take some blood. Is that OK? Um, anyone in the audience want to say they would let that person in? Um, and so it's really uh, to do this work appropriately, to have an impact, you really have to integrate yourself in pretty thoughtful ways with the community. Um, you know, and fortunately, things have changed quite a bit since, since we started this work. Um, but early on, a lot of it was actually helping to develop infrastructures. So I thought it might be useful to show a few before and after slides. This was actually our laboratory in Cameroon when we arrived. It was an old military building. Um, and you know, this is actually the better looking part of the building. Um, and right now, we run a fully functional BSL-2 facility where we have separate facilities for discovering viruses in animal populations and human populations. We have a repository that holds tens of thousands of specimens. Uh, again, before and after slide, this was early in our work. Uh, in order to maintain the cold chain where you keep your specimens cold, you need things like dry ice. And one of the ways that you can get dry ice, one of the only ways you can get it in certain parts of the world, is um, working with breweries, because it's a byproduct of the brewing process. And you can imagine, by the time you're done drinking a few beers, you get out there, you really don't have much dry ice left to use. Um, now we're in, in a situation where we have liquid nitrogen generators in most of our sites. And these are able to produce um, you know, some of the coldest um, preservatives that we really have at our disposal simply from air, that are long-term sustainable systems. Um, again, a final before and after shot. This is a, a picture of me um, right when I arrived in Cameroon. Um, and this is my colleague, Colonel Mpudi Ngole. He's sort of the equivalent of the head of Walter Reed. Um, and it's useful to point out just for a moment that uh, militaries around the world play a really important role in development of new vaccines. The US military has been a partner of ours and has played a huge role. And part of that is because they don't just have to protect people in the United States. They have to protect uh, armed forces wherever they may de be deployed. So interestingly, the US military has been responsible for creating vaccines that would never be created for parts of the world that just don't have enough money or enough um, sort of interest from pharmaceutical companies to create them. In parts of the world, like Central Africa, these are some of the best health infrastructures out there. Uh, so this is the before shot of me early on. Um, I won't make any comment on that one. Um, uh, but um, you, you know, field work can change you. That's all I can say. Um, and, and actually, I want to show you here. This is uh, Ubal Tamofe. You can see him from the front. And I mentioned um, my postdoctoral mentor, Don Burke, who really, um, we really founded and started this work in Central Africa together. Um, and I thought it might be worthwhile just to show you a Indeed, video in a remote region of Cameroon. Two hunters stalk their prey. Their names are Patrice and Petit. They're searching for bushmeat. Forest animals they can kill to feed their families. 
Patrice and Petit set out most days to go out hunting in the forest around their homes. They have a series of traps, of snares that they've set up. And they'll catch wild pigs, snakes, monkeys, rodents, anything they can, really. Patrice and Petit have been out for hours but found nothing. The animals are simply gone. We stop for a drink of water. Then there's a rustle in the brush. A group of hunters approach. Their packs loaded with wild game. There's at least three viruses that you know about which are in this particular monkey. This species, yeah. And there's many, many more pathogens that are present in these animals. These individuals are at specific risk, particularly if there's blood contact, they're at risk for transmission and possibly infection with novel viruses. As the hunters display their kills, something surprising happens. They show us filter paper they've used to collect the animal's blood. The blood will be tested for zoonotic viruses, part of a program Dr. Wolf has spent years setting up. So this is from this animal right here, greater spot nose guanin. Every person who has one of those filter papers has at least at a minimum been through our basic health education about the risks associated with these activities, which uh, presumably from our perspective gives them the ability to decrease their own risk and then obviously the risk to their families, the village, the country, and the world. And, um, so hopefully that gives you just a little bit of a, a flavor for what it's like to do this work. And I, I'm sorry to sort of land on um, this somewhat disturbing um, photo, but I, I, it's always important from my perspective. I didn't actually go out to Central Africa with the objective of feeling strongly about sort of the bushmeat trade or the hunting um, of wild game in Central Africa, but I really did uh, emerge from my work feeling that this is a very, very important issue and something that we all have to sort of think about and be aware of. Um, if you're like me um, and many people in, in, the, in the United States, your first sort of thoughts about bushmeat or the hunting of wild animals in these parts of the world probably came from the conservation community, from the idea that we were, um, you know, hunting to extinction valuable species. And, and certainly, I, I would put forward that our children and grandchildren, when they sort of look back to this period and they say, they judge us based on how good we were as custodians of our planet, they certainly are gonna say, you know, how, how was it appropriate that you permitted some of the most valuable endangered species, some of our closest relatives, to go extinct because uh, you weren't capable of helping to provide resources to some of the poorest populations in the world. But on top of that, they're also gonna say, it, it's not just about the conservation, they're gonna say when you knew that there was food security issues and that people in these regions as their population expanded were not gonna have sustainable sources of animal protein, how come you didn't do something and get out there? But I think what we've also learned is that they're gonna say, um, when you knew that a virus like HIV had the potential to jump from animals into humans and that it was associated with these particular kind of activities, how could you let these animals be hunted for five or ten dollars when you knew it had the potential to potentially burden uh, your world and many, many future generations with a disease that we wouldn't be able to get rid of? Um, and I think that that's going to be something that's, I think this bushmeat is something that's a, a fundamental issue for us. Uh, the other thing that they're going to ask, though, is, um, and this is the individual, you can kind of see the arm of the uh, animal from that last shot. This is the gentleman who was the hunter. They're going to ask us, why did we think that really the fault in this situation uh, rested with individuals like this? So this is a person I spent some time with in the field. Um, you can kind of see from his shot uh, hunting in these parts of the world is not, um, is not something that's a recreation. When you actually calculate the amount of calories that it takes to get some animals, on some days individuals are actually spending more calories to actually hunt than the amount of calories that they're bringing in from the prey that they have. Uh, and I really think that um, since this is one of these classic sort of tragedy of the common situations, it's really a cost for all of us. A disease that spreads around the world is a major cost for everybody. And I think the notion that we depend upon some of the poorest populations in the world or think of them as sort of the 
um, the sort of the source or the, you know, the, 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 the problem here really reflects a lack of understanding uh, and, and a, a need for us or a desire for us to sort of push the problem under the rug. And I think if we're not willing to address these things, um, we're going we're gonna to have a whole range of issues that are going to emerge for us. Um, now I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the results that we've had. So it was difficult work to establish it, but if you do, you can actually collect incredible amounts of specimens, and you can actually watch as these viruses are jumping into human populations, which, of course, was our objective. Uh, you can also find new agents. So, right, if the idea is to stop the next HIV, you can go out there and find things like HIV that are in the process of jumping from animals into people and give us those sorts of benefits that I referred to, those kinds of chaotic benefits that are going to lead to all sorts of positive consequences in the future. And I'll give you just a few examples um, and jump into the scientists, science a little bit here for some of the biologists in the crowd. So HIV, of course, is a retrovirus. And so one of our questions was, well, where does HIV, at the time we didn't really know that HIV emerged from chimpanzees. So we said, where did HIV come from? We thought it was probably primates. But we also said, look, if HIV can cross into human populations, then presumably other retroviruses that are out there have the potential to cross into people as well. So we, in particular, uh, looked at a couple of important retroviruses outside of the HIV family. One was the Delta retroviruses, HTLV, and one was the Spuma retroviruses. This is Fomivirus. The interesting thing about Fomivirus is that each particular species of animal has its own version of foamy virus. And so if it's crossing over, you can really know where it comes from. And then what we did is we screened through hunters that we were working with, uh, and we found, and this shows you one of these family trees um, of, of foamy virus, and th these are the different animals that these viruses infect. What you see in blue is our hunters. And so what we were able to demonstrate definitively is, for example, one of these hunters was infected with the gorilla virus. And anyway, you can see, and this was, this was very interesting from our perspective, because it was, we had known from HIV that there had to have been moments in history when viruses jumped from animals to people. But what we didn't know was whether or not these were incredibly, incredibly rare phenomena, or whether they occurred on a regular basis. And what we showed in this work, that this was sort of a natural phenomena and that there was ongoing transmission of these viruses under normal conditions into human populations. And this was certainly a surprise for us. Um, and when we did the detailed behavioral epidemiology, we were able to go back and really dig in and find um, you know, great support for our work in the sense that this was uh, a 45-year-old male who, uh, who we found with the gorilla virus. And we asked them what their exposures were. And while a lot of these people um, have exposure to, uh, to wild animals, um, as, as again, the hunters in the crowd will attest to, hunting and butchering of gorillas is not something that should be tried by any hunter. And so this was really a very specialized activity, and the correspondence between the virus and this, this activity really told us that what we were seeing was kind of a, a real-time activity that these viruses were being transmitted. The next set of viruses we looked at was the group of viruses called, these are the Delta retroviruses. And again, HCLV1 and HCLV2 had a history um, of emerging from primate reservoirs, non-human primate reservoirs. And there was another virus out there called STLV3 um, that was present in primates. And we were sort of, our hypothesis there is if we look carefully, we'll probably see evidence of this, or may see evidence of this in in people, and this was quite interesting because HCLV1 and HCLV2, they may not be viruses that you've heard of, but these are viruses um, that are important human viruses, something on the order of 20, 25 million people globally are infected with these viruses, and about five to 10% of those people get sick, sometimes with very dramatic symptoms and diseases like leukemia, for example. Um, and so uh, when, when, again, we look at this similar kind of family tree, we found um, that, in fact, yes, we could find evidence of these primate STLV3s for simian T lymphotropic virus that, in fact, had jumped into people. And colleagues of ours, particularly some French uh, research groups, have confirmed this and extended these results to really show that there's a number of people who have been infected sort of in our lifetime with new retroviruses, sort of very similar to the way that HIV crossed over into people. 
And the other thing that we found, which was exciting for us, was HTLV4, which was a brand new virus. We didn't know where it had originated. Um, and just to give you a sense of sort of how long it takes to do some of this research, among the many other things that we were doing during the last 10 years, is we were looking for the reservoir. Um, and we actually just reported it this year. And in fact, we found it to be gorillas. In fact, it was a gorilla virus that had jumped over into people. Um, so it really takes long-term investment and long-term um, sort of dedication to be able to, 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 to complete these kinds of efforts. Uh, once we really recognized that it was possible to do this work, that we could have a model where we actually could set up a listening post and monitor the transmission of these viruses from animals to people, um, we took a step back and we said, really what we need to do is to extend this effort, and we need to do it globally. And this is really when we founded Global Viral, which is the nonprofit um, that uh, has been uh, supported by some, some great organizations like Google.org and the Skoll Foundation. Uh, and we set up sites around the world to really create these listening posts and to be able to try to monitor the spread in a systematic way. And the idea was to focus on hotspots, where we knew that there were critical reservoirs, uh, and they end up being things like bats and primates and, to a certain extent, rodents, and really doing enhanced surveillance in the right kinds of populations who are heavily exposed to monitor the movement of these particular viruses. Um, and in addition to traditional surveillance, where you would actually take a specimen, I thought it might be fun just to talk a little bit about a new and emerging field that I think some of the young scientists here, I imagine some of you will probably end up doing this over the course of your career, which is digital disease detection. And the idea here is we now have so much more data that there may be other non-traditional ways. Maybe, in fact, we can use the accelerometers in cell phones. Because what we know, for example, is that people, when they get infected and have fevers, their mobility patterns change. So there may be more ubiquitous ways that we can pull in data and utilize them for good purposes, in particular to see patterns when new diseases might be emerging. And I'll just give you one example that um, came out of our team. We're based in San Francisco in the midst of the sort of Silicon Valley data revolution, if you will. And we had some really smart software engineers that came in and they used natural language processing in order to um, use training data from articles and blogs that were out there, just open source information on the web, um, and to train computers to basically be able to identify um, combinations of words and different patterns of words that indicate outbreaks. And what you see here, which is pretty, pretty notable, is E. coli is not included. So this gives you a sense of what the computer, when it's really reading these articles, sees. And the reason we wouldn't use E. coli is because we're trying to get things early on before they've really been identified as being a particular agent. So we just want, it's an outbreak, things are dying. Um, and I'll just show you a video that gives you a little bit of, sen of a sense of how this work uh, really happens. And what's amazing here is what you, you're seeing. This is the E. coli outbreak in 2011 in Central Europe. So that's Germany. And the data here, there was no samples collected. There was no, um, we never put our hands on any particular sample. This is simply uh, news articles and blog posts that were looked at sort of retrospectively using these algorithms to identify exactly. And you can see how much information you can find. And critically, you can see how early the system is really able to detect these sorts of things. So this is the future, is going to be combined digital systems and international systems. And I really think we do have some potential to get to a world where we will be able to um, prevent future pandemics like HIV. Um, and I'm going to um, talk you through one example that I think is particularly relevant. I had the opportunity to visit uh, the Galveston National Lab the other day, which is a, a top biocontainment facility um, in Galveston. It's one of only about a dozen or so in the world that's capable of looking at the most deadly pathogens. And to tell you a little bit about how this kind of work happens is in uh, the Bakongo province of Congo, uh, right on the very western side of the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, there was an outbreak. And again, this is part of networks that we have established and consortiums that we collaborate with in Central Africa. And so what we had is two young children, a boy and a girl, who died of a very deadly disease. It looked like Ebola, so there was uh, hemorrhagic symptoms, very dramatic, um, devastating symptoms, bleeding from the eye, and these sorts of things. 
Um, we, um, you know, our collaborators in Congo and our, our collaborators at Doctors Without Borders investigated this outbreak, got a single specimen from one of the health workers who also became infected and actually survived. The virus went to uh, our collaborating laboratories they, where they look at all the usual suspects. So this is serum from Gabon. And what they determined was it wasn't Ebola, it wasn't Marburg, it, it wasn't yellow fever, all the usual suspects, stone cold negative. Then we sort of move it in our triage system up, um, upstream to the work that we do in uh, some really technical laboratories. And we were able to identify using new technologies, and I'll tell you about a little about, about these technologies in a second, um, a completely novel virus, which we call the Bakongo virus. It only shares 34% similarity with any other virus previously identified. It's something that literally even five or 10 years ago we wouldn't have been able to discover. Um, and this tells you just a little bit, and, and uh, ignore the technical detail, the important thing is when we started off, we used deep sequencing technologies that identify all the genetic information in a particular specimen. So if we take a drop of blood or a drop of water, we'll see all the genetic information. They're not just some particular target we're looking for. And so there was one little teeny piece, 150 base pairs of information that we saw that looked like it might be an interesting virus. And based on that bit of information, we basically extended it you know, piece by piece to reconstruct the entire virus, um, which is uh, still a pretty small virus. It's only about 10,000 bits of genetic information. Amazingly, now you can actually think about, even from the information, literally sending it as a string of A, C, T's, and G's by email, for example, and recreating the virus um, through some really amazing techniques called reverse genetics, and then being able to actually work with it in high containment laboratories like the labs you have in Galveston to be able to understand it, how does it harm people, create diagnostics, and to really sort of complete the cycle of being able to um, not only detect these things early, but to be able to prepare for uh, sort of future outbreaks. Um, and I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit um, right before we end here to tell you a little bit about what these techniques, because they, they do really much more in the future. They're gonna tell us about deadly diseases, but really, really much more. Um, and one of the things they're gonna indicate to us is how much we don't know about the microbial world around us. And so a little thought experiment is if you sort of were to imagine a specimen, let's say we took a swab of your nose, for example, and we applied these deep sequencing tools and really sort of looked for all the genetic information uh, in your nose, what we would find is we'd see an incredibly massive amount of genetic information. And of course, a lot of this would be human genetic information, right? We're human, so we'd see a ton of that. We'd also see bacteria, a few viruses that were human viruses, a lot of viruses that were infecting the bacteria that lived in our noses. But what's really amazing is that there'd be a reasonable amount of this information that would be, let's see if we can get this to move, um, completely unclassifiable. Even in your nose, there's information that doesn't match anything that's ever been identified before. And this is something that we are increasingly calling biological dark matter. And uh, what's amazing about it from our perspective um, is that it really represents um, what I truly believe about our microbial world, which is that there's a lot of potential harm here but there's also just a tremendous amount of unknowns. There's gonna be solutions to cancer. There's gonna be cancers, like we have, you know, we, knowledge that human papillomavirus causes most of cervical cancer allows us to create a vaccine for cervical cancer. There's other cancers out there that are caused by viruses that we're gonna identify. There's potential pandemics that we're gonna have the potential to stop. We're gonna find solutions to things like type one diabetes. There's gonna be a whole range of things that we're gonna discover um, that it's gonna change the way that we address our health and our environment, and even the sense of uh, sort of our philosophical perceptions of who we are and what it means to be alive. And so um, in addition to sort of the public health significance, I think there's a big exploration here, which is you know, many of us, I think, despair perhaps a little bit at the idea that we're not gonna discover new continents, there's not a lot of new species out there, but at least in some realms, and particularly the unseen realm around us, I think we really live in a world that looks like this, there are new continents to be discovered in that world. And so, just returning for a moment back to Jon Snow, 
you know, one of the things that um, I ask my students at Stanford and I will, I will pose to the Austin College students as well as the, the, the people that work on my staff is really to imagine, let's say we had Jon Snow who was alive here and sitting in this audience. What would he be thinking about? Well, I would tell you on the one hand, he would be thinking about the sort of exquisite risk that we have because of this interconnectivity of human populations. But he'd also be thinking about the amazing tools that he'd be able to put together and to think about sort of um, the significance and the importance of these things. And I'll just leave you with our, the data scientists on our team and their sort of uh, contemporary interpretation of the John Snow, what Jon Snow would have been producing of his sorts of maps today. Um, and, uh, and while I'm letting you watch that, I just want to, again, express a tremendous amount of uh, appreciation for the honor to um, partic participate in this program and um, really the opportunity to spend time both yesterday and today with uh, people in your community and get a chance to learn a little bit more about what you're doing and hopefully put in a nice little pitch about uh, the future of exploration in the microbial world. So thank you very much. That was just uh, tremendous, having read your book and uh, seen some of the videos you've done. This is just a tremendous way of helping uh, all of us understand why this work matters. And I think everyone in the audience today probably um, knows somebody who died of HIV or who lost a loved one um, of H from HIV and knows just how devastating that plague was. Uh, for uh, many communities, but certainly for the communities in which our gay friends and, um, and family members inhabited. And the idea that the work you're doing today could prevent that kind of devastation from happening um, to future communities is, is holy work. And we're just really appreciative of the work you're doing and of your willingness to share it, share it with us and help us understand how we can be a, a part of it. Um, we're going to have a presentation tonight where we will present you officially with the Posey Award. But at this point, it is my pleasure for us to have a presentation from our student body. And I'd like to introduce Chris Taylor, who is um, a junior from Plano, Texas. He's working on a major in biology and a minor in environmental studies. He's a member of Zeta Chi Beta, which is a service and leadership fraternity. He tells us that he likes to be outside and to travel and to learn how things work. So he may become a virus hunter in his future. He just returned from a semester in East Africa where he was doing research on elephants. So I don't know if elephants are a typical source of uh, jumping viruses, but you may want to consult with him uh, before that. And he's hoping to be a, a surgeon. So please welcome the president of the Austin College Student Assembly, Chris Taylor. Well, thank you, President Haas, for that uh, introduction. And thank you, Mr. Wolf, for an inspiring talk. If that doesn't make you want to get up and research, I don't know what does, but maybe that's the biology nerd in me. Um, so on behalf of the students both here and elsewhere from Austin College, I'd like to present you with a gift. Um, I hope you appreciate it. And uh, knowing that your father is here, we also have some special gifts in the basket for him as well. So thank you. Excellent. I get some kangaroos in here as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot.